Thank you, Peg. Take your Bibles with me and let's look at God's Word together from Romans chapter 12, if you will, with me. Turn to Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9. Ted Ingstrom has written a book, it's just simply one word title, it's called Integrity. And in the book, he tells the story of Cleveland Stroud, who was the high school basketball coach of the Rockdale County Bulldogs in Georgia. In their championship season, they went 21 and 5 and they dominated the league. The championship game was particularly noteworthy as they came from behind in the game and won it in the dying seconds. They celebrated as a town the great victory, they had a parade, they did all those kinds of things. But two weeks after they won the championship, Coach Stroud found out that one of the players was scholastically ineligible. He had only played 45 seconds in one game. That was it. He's a backup player. Coach Stroud, though, reported it to the Sports Authority of Georgia, and they stripped the Bulldogs of their title and gave it to the runner-up. The town was infuriated. I mean, it was a championship. The parents were in disarray. The players were upset. Coach Stroud brought together the whole team. And he sat them down as a team and he said this to them. I'm going to quote it to you. Some people are saying that we should have kept quiet about it. That it was just 45 seconds during a whole playoff run and the player made no significant impact. But you will always have to do what is right, guys. You will always have to play by the rules. People will forget the scores of basketball games over years, but they will not forget what you're made of and the kind of person that you are. That's a good coach. Costly sometimes. To be a person of integrity, to be a person of honor, but that's what God calls the disciples of Christ to be. Certainly, integrity and honor should characterize every follower of Jesus Christ. And whether we're aware of it or not, whether we're conscious of it or not through this next week, the world's going to be watching you as a follower of Christ. And they're looking for integrity. And they're looking for an honorable person. And the world will scrutinize our lives, and we won't like it, but we're called to be honorable. To honor one another, to honor other people. You'll find tests that will come your way in the business world. Your integrity will be challenged. But it's not just the way we relate to the world where there needs to be integrity. And it's not just that they watch. They actually watch how this family, how this body of Christ interacts together. And if there really is integrity and honor amongst us in ourselves. So integrity and honor is something that we need to walk out of here with today and exemplifies the community, but it also needs to be something that is within us as the body of Christ, that we need to honor one another, and when we do, we honor Christ. Romans chapter 12, Paul begins, and again, it's important that we notice as we did last week that these little statements that we've been looking at, these one another statements, they're set in settings. And the jewel is magnified when we look at the setting. And it's written with intentionality. So we're not just pulling out one statement each week from outside of a context. We want to look at it in the context. That's very important for us to do that as we look at this. And as Paul starts to talk about loving one another, the first thing he mentions is integrity. He says, love must be sincere. It must be honest. Love must have an integrity to it. Now as we go through the summer and look at all of these weeks of these one another statements, there's certainly going to be some overlap. And the overarching theme of all of the one another statements is the concept of loving one another. We will not forgive one another if we don't love one another. We will not honor one another if we do not love one another, and so on. So love is going to be a theme that you're going to hear throughout the whole summer as we talk about the body of Christ, the community of believers. And it's so important that we're mindful of our integrity, of honesty, of what people say of us. This last week I did two funerals, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday, and it just reminded me again, when you do a funeral, there's always those uh, tributes that are given. And it's interesting to me how many tributes there are that speak about simply two things. What the person did and what the person accomplished in their life. 
But there's not as much nearly said as about who the person is, who they are, their integrity, their character. Paul's very concerned. He says, love must be sincere. Now, as he writes this, before we get to the one another, he actually gives us some prerequisites. If we're actually going to honor one another, then there's some things that have to be happening in our lives. If they're not happening, we will not honor one another. So before he even gets to that actual concept, he gives us three things to consider. Watch it in verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. These are the prerequisites, the things that should be happening first if we're ever going to actually honor one another. And here they are. Here's the first one. If we're going to honor one another, our love must be sincere. That is without hypocrisy, without any phoniness to it, so that I don't speak of somebody this way and act this way before them and then in a different context speak completely different about them and act completely differently towards them. That's hypocrisy. Paul said hypocrisy has no place in this community of believers, this family of God. There's no room for hypocrisy. There's no room to, to say and talk and act like this and we're all together here on Sunday and, and speak highly of each other and then go out there and criticize each other and tear each other down and act differently. That's hypocrisy. We need to understand how serious that is because to live with hypocrisy is to live like Judas. Judas was hypocritical. His life was characterized by hypocrisy. He said all the right things in the right group. He was sent out with one of the other 12 by Jesus, two by two. They went out. They went on a, a short-term, we could say, missionary journey. He listened to all the teachings of Jesus. And finally, in the end, the vileness of his heart and the hypocrisy of his heart was actually shown for what it was. We detest the idea of Judas. None of you here probably have called your children Judas. It's because of the hypocrisy of us. It has no place in the family of God. So Paul says, listen, if we're ever going to honor one another, we've got to get rid of the hypocrisy. Our love towards each other, our words towards each other, our actions towards each other, they all must be sincere. And isn't it interesting? It's not an encouragement. It, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Paul says love must be be sincere. There's no options. Our love towards each other, our words towards each other, they must have sincerity in them. It must be that way or we cannot honor one another. We cannot pretend that somehow we'll just honor one another and we can couple that together with hypocrisy. No, Paul says the very first thing we must understand if we're ever going to honor one another is that our love must be sincere. And then he goes on and says this, secondly, if we're going to honor one another, then you must hate what is evil. This is a very strong word. What it means is this. We must be horrified by evil. Does evil horrify us? Does evil cause us any shock at all anymore? I seriously wonder in the church of North America, in the society that we live in, if that's true. We are not horrified by evil. We are not horrified by sin. We're not shocked by it. We're not appalled by it any longer. We're not repulsed by it any longer. It doesn't prick our consciences much at all. We become so familiar with it that we're desensitized to it. It doesn't disturb us and it certainly doesn't grieve us. Paul said, listen, if you are ever in this family going to honor one another, you have to understand you need to be horrified by sin, horrified by evil. The problem is the reason that we've become like that as a church is very simple. It's because we live in a society like that. We are constantly being bombarded with things. Things that 15 years ago, if we had seen on television or in the movie theaters, we'd have been horrified by it. But we are not horrified by it any longer. It doesn't disturb us at all. 
the cartoons that I grew up on in television are totally different than what you see today. There is a blatant disrespect between parents and children that we are not horrified by. We just laugh at. We just go along with. We see sexual acts in television and movies. We see violence. It doesn't horrify us. We sit down and we are entertained by these things. We watch a show where there are 15 or 20 people killed in the show and it doesn't even bother us. They're actually murdered and it's all entertainment to us. If we're ever going to honor one another, Paul says where our love has to be sincere. And we have to be getting back to the idea of being horrified but what horrifies God. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 3 to 8, you look it up later, just jot it down for now. It says, it's God's will that my people would be holy. That they would avoid all kinds of sexual immorality and that they would not wrong one another in sexual conduct. People will be judged for these things, says Paul. We need reminding of that. Violence. We need reminded that God is abhorred by violence. Disrespect for authority. Paul does not even begin to list examples. Because even in his day, the list would be so long. And so the word evil that he uses is just a general term. It just simply means this, that any moral quality that is opposed to the moral qualities of God and his holiness, anything that's opposed to the goodness of God, his purity, his holiness, it should be abhorrent to us. Anything like that. But it isn't. And so because we're, we're coming so much like our society, we fail to honor one another. There's a direct connection between sincere love, between being horrified by evil and honoring one another. Then he gives us a third one. And by the way, we need to hate what God hates before we will ever love what God loves. That's the direct connection to this honoring. You will not love what God hates and then turn around and honor one another. When we hate what God hates, we will love what God loves, and God loves his people. And if we're going to love his people and honor his people, we've got to hate those things that God rejects and that grieve his spirit. We need to hate evil before we can truly love one another. Now, these are word pictures that Paul's using. So, be horrified by evil. And then he comes across with a third one. Here's the third prerequisite before he even gets to honoring one another. And that is that we must cling... To that which is good. The, the word cling that's used here in the NIV translation, it simply means to be glued to, to be stuck fast with. It's like you should be super glued to those things which are good. That's the idea. In fact, Paul uses the term, not Paul rather, but Luke uses the term in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 29, a familiar story. So the Ethiopian eunuch's gone down to Jerusalem. He comes back up in his chariot and an angel of the Lord comes to Philip and says, I want you to go down to this road and watch for a chariot there. He goes down there and then the spirit of the Lord comes to Philip, or comes to Philip and says, okay, I want you to go up and stay near that chariot. That's the expression. The spirit of God said to Philip, I'm going to do something in that man's heart, in that chariot. I want you to go up to that chariot and I want you to be stick like it like glue. I want you to stick to it. Be glued to it. And he is and he does. And God uses him. And the man ends up becoming Christian, ends up becoming baptized, and you know the rest of the story. That's the picture. We are to be glued to that which is good. We are to be rooted in that which is good. We are to be stuck fast to that which is good. Because if we are, the natural result will be good fruit. If we're not, we won't produce good fruit. You see the connections? Love must be sincere, and you need to be horrified by what horrifies God, and you need to stick like glue to those things which are good because they'll produce good fruit, and the Spirit of God will use you, and good fruit will come from that. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, and verse 35. A good person brings up good things out of the good stored up in them, and an evil person brings out evil things out of the evil stored up in them. So honoring one another, if we're clinging to that which is good, is not something you're going to have to even consciously think about. It's going to naturally happen. There'll be good fruit produced. Why? Because you're horrified by evil and you're clinging 
to that which is good. Now then, verse 10. Here's the outflow. Here's the outworking of honoring one another. It says, let's go back to verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. As far as working out in the body of Christ, this honoring one another, the first thing that Paul says is that we've got to understand, we've got to be devoted to one another. I don't know if you're, you're noticing as we look into God's word, but there should be a dramatic difference between our world, our culture, and the church, the family of God. Not only when it comes to being horrified by evil, but even in this concept of being devoted. Our society knows very little about being devoted anymore in almost every area. It used to be that you would go to work and you would work for a company. And you would work for your manager or your boss. And it was the idea that you wanted them to succeed. You were working for their success. Nowadays, it's not like that. We're not devoted to our employer. We're not devoted to our job. We want to get out of there as soon as we can. In fact, if they get successful, we want a piece of the pie. And we need some more things. And that concept of devoted is slipped away in our society. Not only that, you notice it well in devotion of marriage. Couples aren't devoted for life anymore. Some couples don't even want that till death do us part in their vows anymore. Where is the concept of being devoted in marriage? The idea of devotion in a place that we worship, the family of God, the local assembly that we come to. I don't like that singing. I don't like all the hymn stuff. I don't like all the choruses. I wish they would have a youth group. You know what? We're going to go find somewhere else. Somebody's offended you in the body. Instead of making it right, I'm just going to go find a different church. Because we're not devoted. We've lost the concept of what it means to be devoted. You see it all the time in the sports realm. It's a self-centered sports realm. It's all about me as the athlete. It's not about a devotion to a city. It's not about a devotion to a team. Highest bidder, best benefits. Right now, some of you are thinking of Kawhi Leonard, aren't you? Sure you are. That's what happened. The devotion has gone from society. And the church is starting to slip into the same mold. And that concept of devotion is slipping quickly from us. So as Paul talks to the church, he says, listen, your brothers and sisters in Christ... If you're ever going to honor one another, you've got to be devoted to one another, committed to one another, loyal to one another to the end. This idea of devotion, this word is most commonly used in a family setting. Now, I know there's no perfect families, but that's where it's coming from. So it's be devoted like family members are in a loving, caring, strong family home. Have you ever noticed as parents that when your kids, are, they can fight, can't they? And it just makes us want to pull our, in fact, we did. We did pull our hair out, but it, it, you just, they drive you crazy because how can we not get along in this house? How come you guys are always, the, there's nothing that I got more lickings for, only two, than, than that idea of Marilyn and I squabbling and fighting. My mom hated it when we did that. And I would tease her and I'd get spanked for that and I'd tease her again. And I didn't but I'll tell you something. When we went to elementary school, and then we were in the school ground, if somebody picked on my sister, I will tell you, they will pay for that. Why? Because we are family. Because even though we have these differences, that there's a loyalty there between Marilyn and I. Because she's my sister, and when push comes to shove, Paul's saying, listen, you are brothers and sisters in this family. Be devoted, have a loyalty to one another that supersedes your petty differences. That's what he's getting at with it. We've got to understand the idea of being devoted to one another. My sister Marilyn and I, our family ties were bloodlines. When Paul's talking about the devotion in the family here, he's not talking about culture or race or bloodlines. He's talking about that you are family because you are one in Christ. You're the deemed bride of Christ. So be devoted to one another because you're both bought by the same blood. 
Because you're one in Christ and you're a family. And that's the ties. And not only that, but you are a people who understand sincere love. And you are a people who have in common that you hate and are horrified by evil. And you are a people, and it makes you a family, that you are actually clinging to and sticking to that which is good. That's what this family does. So we need to understand what it means when Paul says, be devoted to one another like a loving, caring family should be. That's what he's asking them to do. Now, let me just say this. It'll be a lot easier if we understand theologically the outworking of that. You say, oh boy, I'm going to get lost now. Here's theology. No, you know what? It's simple. Let me just put it to you this way. Why we honor one another is twofold. It's because I understand that these people that I'm worshiping with, these people that I call my family, spiritually we're one of Christ, we are made in the image of the living God. That's theology. I love you and honor you and care for you because you're made in the image of the living God and you have infinite value and worth. And oh, we don't all see eye to eye on the same thing. We don't like all the same foods and we don't like all the same exercises and we don't like all the same sports teams. But I'll tell you something. We are all made in the image of God in this family and so is all mankind, but in this family particularly, we love and honor each other because of that great value. God values you. You are made in his image. That's why we honor one another. But even more than that, not so much more than that, but along with that, is this simple truth. We honor one another because Christ himself actually lives in us. That's a remarkable truth to get your head around. Jesus said in John 17, I myself will be in them. Why do we honor one another? Because Christ is in us. So therefore, when I honor you, I honor Christ. When I dishonor you, I dishonor Christ. You see the theology there? So we need to understand that we're all made in the image of God. That's why we're called to honor one another. But not only that, Christ himself, the living, resurrected Savior, lives in you. And so therefore, I am called to honor you. And by doing so, I'm honoring my master. If I dishonor you, I am dishonoring my master. So Paul says love should be sincere. Hate what's evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. It's the third part of this outworking is that we are called to honor one another above ourselves. So the world is self-centered. This family of God is to be others-centered. There's always a direct difference between the church and the world. The world is constantly looking out for self-interest. We are to look out for others' interest. Jared read to us at the very beginning of the service, just set the table for us. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3 and 4, and Paul outlines about Jesus Christ. And he simply says this, Brothers and sisters, do nothing out of selfish ambition or in vain conceit, but consider others better than yourselves. And he goes on and says, Your attitude should be the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who considered himself nothing. See, we're called to follow in the steps of our Master in this honoring of one another and honoring one another above ourselves. There's over 42 verses in the New Testament that condemn the idea of selfishness. It goes directly against that society that we're going to walk out of here and become part of in just a few moments. But we're to be different. We're to honor one another above ourselves. That concept that we've spoken of a couple of times, the children's feature and otherwise, but that concept of love. John puts it this way. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, we know we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers and sisters. Whoever does not love still abides in death. That concept of honoring one another, it's overarching theme, loving one another. John says, you know what, if, if we're not going to do this, if, if we're not going to love one another and honor one another, we're still living like we're dead in our sin. He goes on in chapter 4 and verse 20. If anyone says, well, I love God, and he hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. 
For he does not have, if he does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he's not seen. So John equates that with salvation. If we love one another and honor one another, that's total evidence that you're saved. But if you are not loving each other and you are not honoring one another, John says, I'm not even sure if you passed from death to life yet. So it's a very serious matter. Let me just show you as we close an example in the Old Testament of what it means to honor one another. All the principles of the New Testament, they're all illustrated in the Old Testament. So if you want to know what it means to love or honor one another, show me an example. I'm glad you asked. Let's do that. Let's go to 1 Samuel just as we close this morning. In chapter 18. Chapter 17 is that very famous and well-known story, David and Goliath. So the battle's just taken place. And I'm going to pick it up with you in chapter 17 and verse 55. Simply says this. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with David still holding the Philistine's head. Ooh, I know. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. So you got the picture in your mind? David's just a young kid, young teenager. The commander Abner is there of the entire army. Saul is there, the king. And we're going to find out in just a moment the royal prince, Jonathan, is right there. Jonathan's significantly older. He's led the troops. And David's just a teenager. Watch what it says about David and Jonathan. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. And he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. How did Jonathan honor David? Three things we should notice here. First, he became one with him in spirit, the scripture says. In fact, I like the way the ASV puts it better. It says that the soul of Jonathan and David were knit together. They were one in purpose, honoring and serving God. Their souls were knit together. We will honor one another as we realize our souls are knit together in Christ. We are a family in Christ. We're glued together. We're, we have a relationship with each other. And our spirits are knit together. That's what it says in the text here. Sometimes you might hear a couple say that, uh, a couple of people or a couple in a, in a sense of a marriage, they'll say, well, they're my soul mate. I don't really like that expression. Sorry, but it just doesn't... Soul mate gets the idea that it's something really unique between just these two people. Really, all it means a soulmate, is that their souls are knit together. The scripture says that all of our souls are knit together in Christ. We are one in Christ. We are all soulmates here, we could say. Your spirit is knit with the person who's next to you if they know Christ and you know Christ. So they're one in spirit, what it means to honor one another. Two times in this text we're told that Jonathan loved David as himself. That's an interesting expression. He literally loved him as his own soul. If we're going to honor one another, we're going to love the person's soul. Not just that I like and I love going camping with you, or I, I, I love playing games with you, or I love having you over for barbecue. You guys are great. Or, no, it's more than that. Far more than that. It's the idea that I have at my heart's interest the interests of your soul. I'm very concerned about your soul. I'm very concerned about your walk with God. That's what it means to honor one another. It's more than having fun together. It's more than enjoying each other. It's more than complimenting each other. It's like David and Jonathan. It's that concept right there that we love each other as our own soul. We are very concerned about each other's soul. That's what it means to honor 
somebody. And then he does something really unique. This is the third aspect of it. So you got to picture it again. You got Abner, who's a warrior and the general, and you got the king, and you got the crown prince, who's all dressed in his royal robes with his royal sword and everything else, and you got this, you know, teenage kid who just happened to win the victory. And he's standing before him. And Jonathan does something remarkable. He publicly exalts and honors David in the eyes of other people. Doesn't matter who they are, even if they're the highest up in the land. And so Jonathan takes off his royal robe. He says, David, come here. And he puts it on David. And he takes off his tunic and puts it on David. And I like the way the Holy Spirit records this. He even took his sword, the text says. He took his own sword off. The crown prince did. Said, David, this is yours. And so too, David, not just the sword, but also what else? It says also his belt and also his bow. You're worthy of it all. He's honoring him in a public way. He's exalting him in a public way. I'm not crazy about paraphrases and the message, but I really like the way it's put here by Eugene Peterson. This is how he translates it. He became totally committed to David. From that point on, he would be David's number one advocate and friend. That's what it means to honor each other. It means that we're not ashamed of each other out there publicly. That we speak well of each other publicly, no matter who we're with. No matter how high up the person or influential a person might be, it doesn't matter at all to us. We're going to express our love and appreciation and honor for each other. That's what Jonathan did. I mean, he's the guy that's next in line for the throne. And he's taken off his royal robe and his sword and his belt and his tunic and his bow and he's saying, you're worthy of these. I want you to be exalted right here, right now, in front of everybody. Don't ever be ashamed of Christ. Don't ever be ashamed of one another. Because when you're ashamed of one another, you're indirectly being ashamed of Christ. Because Christ is in your brother. Christ is in your sister. It's a great challenge for us. So I just want to encourage you this week. None of us are perfect. We all fail. We all sometimes are not horrified by sin like we should be. Do you know the key to David's life? He sinned greatly. You know his sin. But he came back and he confessed his sin. And very quickly he realized again, it's wrong, Lord. I've dishonored you. And I can't honor anybody if I don't honor you. So if you fail, and when you fail, keep short accounts with God. Confess your sin. Come back to him and say, Father, I don't know what I'm thinking. I need to be more horrified by what horrifies you. Forgive me for the blindness of my own soul. And bring me back and realign me with your heart so that I can honor you. And then I can honor my brother and my sister. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you've given us illustrations in your word, like David and Jonathan, of what practically speaking it means to honor one another. And Father, I pray that we will realize in this family that our souls are knit together in Christ. And they need to be knit together in our relationships with one another. Father, I pray that we will love one another as our own soul that would be concerned about the soul of my brother and my sister and their walk with God and how they're doing. Father, I pray that we will publicly honor, exalt, and love each other in this week. As you bring opportunities, may we honor you by honoring each other and bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with those cords of love. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.